So every day we interact with people, we deal with people, and we have relationships with people. In Islam, there are different stages for all of this here. The first stage in Islam is وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا To give preference to others even if difficulty has to come your way. This is the highest stage and the first stage. And that is to give preference to others even if difficulty has to come your way. And this is the ayah of the Quran Kareem in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks very highly of the Ansar of Medina. That these people, they were in need themselves, but when the Muhajirun that came from Mecca to Mukarrama, when they arrived in Medina to Murawara, they themselves also were Ansar were in need, but they laid everything that they had for the Muhajirun. So this is the first stage, that you give preference to others, even if difficulty has difficulty has to come your way. If we read some of the examples that the Sahaba radiallahu anhu left for us, is on one occasion when some wealth came to Medina to Munawwara. And now Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam galvanized everybody. The Muhajirun and the Ansar, everyone was together. And Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the Ansar that I have received some wealth. This wealth, I can distribute it to everybody equally. But if I do it in this way, you your brothers from Makkah to Mukarrama who have just arrived. They won't be getting a portion of wealth, but this portion of wealth won't be, won't be sufficient for them to be standing on their feet afterwards. Or you take a second option, and that is, I give all of this wealth exclusively only to the Muhajirun of Makkah. And through this wealth, they will be able to find their own feet, and you will not need to help them anymore. What did the Ansar respond? Subhanallah, the Ansar told Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Nabi of Allah, give the Muhajirun everything, and we will still stand on them. This is Sahaba. What did the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Nabi of Allah, Give our brothers everything. And not that much only, but even as yes, we be spending on them on to our, our daily, daily basis, we will still continue spending on our brothers. This is what is meant here. To give preference to others, even if difficulty has to become your lot. Even if difficulty has to come your way. There are many, many examples, but because of time, I will not go into them. So this is the first stage and the highest stage to give preference to others even if difficulty has to come your way. The next second stage, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه The second stage is that you give preference to, not preference, but you love for others what you love for yourself. This is the second stage. What you love for yourself that the same thing you love for your brother. And the evidence for this here is the hadith of Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you look at the lives of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, the ulama explain and tell us for example, that how the Sahaba truly loved one another. If one person in Medina, just for example, one person in Medina knew himself without a doubt. For example, if there was a thousand people in Medina, the one person could say with a clean heart, without any doubt that I know <clears throat> there is 999 people in this community who is my well wisher Excluding himself, he knew everybody else in the community would love for himself what he would love for his brother. This is the example the Sahaba radiallahu anhu left for us. And this is the true Islamic community that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to bring. A true Islamic community is formed when it is built on love and compassion. This is a true Islamic community. Every member should care for each other and help one another and treat others the way they would love to be treated themselves. So this is the second stage. What is the second stage? To love for others what you love for yourself. And the third stage, 
is the topic of discussion today. The third stage is, if you cannot benefit anybody in any way, the least you can do is don't harm anyone. The least you can do is don't harm anyone. So these are the three stages we have when we interact with one another. I gave you the first two and the third one will be the topic of discussion. That if you can't benefit anyone in any way, then the least you can do is don't harm anyone. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in a hadith, la darara wa la dira. Do not cause harm to others, nor return harm to others, nor reciprocate harm to others. If somebody has harmed you, don't harm him back. So la darara wa la dira. Don't harm others, don't cause harm to others, and don't return harm. This is the hadith of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another hadith, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al Muslimu man salim al Muslimun min lisanihi wa yadi. A very famous hadith. That a Muslim is that person that other Muslims are saved from the harms and the evil of his hand, of his hands and his tongue. Yeah, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A Muslim is that person that other Muslims. But in another hadith of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which comes in Sunan Nisa'i, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Al Muslimu man salim al nas. That not only Muslims, a Muslim is that person that everyone is saved from the evil of his hands and his tongue. This is a Muslim from the hadith of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the lower stage. There is no lower stage than this. This is the lowest and there is no lower stage in this. If you can't benefit anybody, the least you can do is don't harm anyone. The least you can do is don't harm anyone. Look at the practical life of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did he live his life and how sensitive he was when he came to the feelings of other people. His own family members, his friends, his distant everyone. And the Muslim at large, the Muslims at large. How sensitive he was that nothing must become the means of their harm. In his own house, Aisha radiallahu anha narrates that Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he used to get up for tahajjud salah, when he used to get up for tahajjud salah, Aisha radiallahu anha narrates the hadith herself. The Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to get up in such a way, and used to open the door in such a way, go out of the house and come back in the house in such a way, and then it did not become the means of harm or inconvenience or disturbance to anyone in the house. Fatahal Baba Ruwaydan. He said, he, he, she says in the hadith, that Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he had to open the door, he opened it gently. When he had to close the door, he closed it gently. So no one in the house or his wife, who Aisha radiallahu alayhi wa must be disturbed by him opening the door and closing the door. This is the practical life of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A hadith mentions that when Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered the room, and if people were sleeping and some people were awake, then those who were sleeping would not be able to hear his salam. And those who were awake could hear his salam. That's how moderate and how balanced he was. So these are the practical examples of the life of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we have to see our lives, how connected it is to his life. When we come in the house, everybody must be awake. So our door is open in such a way, the lights are on in such a way, that even those who are in a deep sleep have to wake up. I'm home, where's the food, where's this, where's this. So even those who are resting will become the means of disturbance to everyone. But look at the life of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And how Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took into consideration the feelings and the comforts of other people. So that's the third stage. That if you can't benefit anybody, the least you can do is don't harm anybody. And I want to mention a very important point here. Listen to me carefully because if you confuse, then you will be misunderstanding the masala. Because we have this tendency in our cultures that we must hear the things the Imam say and we quote it and sugarcoat it afterwards. The masala is Everybody knows to do optional ibadah. Nafal ibadah is meritorious. It is virtuous. It is plausible. It is something that shapes our Islamic identity. But if you are optional ibadah and you are nafal ibadah, 
is becoming a means of harm and disturbance to other people, then you have to put a pause on your nafil ibadah. This is the masla itself. For example, kissing the hajr aswad in the haram, on the Kaaba, is virtuous, we know the virtues of it, all your sins will be forgiven, etc. But you know by you going to go kiss the hajr aswad, you will be elbowing people, you will be punching people, and you will be pushing people away, then this is inconvenience to other people. Now the ulama will say for you to kiss the Hazrat Aswad is not necessary. Rather just make istilam and move on. So if you know that through your nafal ibadah and your optional ibadah, other people are going to be harmed, then you put a pause on your ibadah. Another example, just to make you understand. For example, the masjid. You come to the masjid, for example, now, and you want to recite Salatul Kaab. And you decide in such a way so loudly that those other people who are performing salah and reading the Quran, they all get disturbed. Now you, you cannot say that it is a brother is reading the Quran, leave him alone. The masla will say that tell that brother who read at home then. Because you reading ibadah and reading the Quran is very good, very important, very beneficial, very fruitful. But now your one ibadah is becoming the means of disturbance to everybody else in the masjid. Somebody is performing salah, he can't concentrate. Somebody is reciting the Quran, he can't concentrate. So you have two options. Either you pause your ibadah for that moment, or you look for an alternative, which you can do the ibadah in the same way, but bring yourself down. Lower your tone. And you also continue reciting the Quran. So the point is, if you know your option in ibadah is becoming the means of disturbance to other people, then learn to pause it, or learn to do it in a different way, which does not become the means of harm to other people. This is how sensitive our Islam is to everything. Even to your family, even to personal ibadah, even to collective ibadah. But even if you're worshipping Allah, do it in such a way that you don't harm other fellow human beings. Because one of the ways to get close to Allah is to benefit His creation. And now you're worshipping Allah but you're harming His creation, then we get together. Becoming the means of disturbance to other people. So it's very important that we bring and imbibe these things in our life. The great Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah used to say, إِنَّ سَرَّكُمْ أَنْ تَسْلَمُوا وَيَسْلَمَ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ فَكَفُّوا أَيْدِيَكُمْ عَنْ دِمَاءِ النَّاسِ Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah says that if you would love to be pleased and you would love to be safe and you would love your religion to be safe for you, then what he says? Then he says, then restrain your hands from harming the lives of other people. If you want your life to be nice, you want your life to be easy, you want your life to be happy, and one of the ways to do this is restrain your hands from harming the lives of other people. And then he said, وَكَفُّوا أَلْسِنَتَكُمْ أَنْ أَعْرَضِهِمْ And restrain your tongues from harming the honor of other people. So your hands don't harm other people by the means of your hands. You will be a happy person. And restrain your tongue from speaking ill and bringing the honor down of other people. If you will have these two things in your life, you will be a happy person. Then he says the third thing, وَكَفُّوا بُطُونَكُمْ عَنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ And restrain your stomach from consuming other people's wealth. Imagine three beautiful things. Make sure you don't harm anyone by the means of your hands, you don't harm anybody by the means of your tongue, and you don't consume other people's wealth, which is haram for you. But rather, whatever goes in your stomach must be halal. So Hassan Basri rahimahullah gives us this important message, that if you can't benefit people, don't harm people. نبي كريم صلى الله عليه وسلم حسن الحديث لقد رأيت رجلا يتقلب في الجنة في شجرة قطعها من ظهر طريق كانت تؤذي الناس نبي كريم صلى الله عليه وسلم said I seen a person enjoying himself in Jannah what did he do that he was enjoying himself in Jannah نبي كريم صلى الله عليه وسلم says if this person saw a tree which is in the middle of the path it was becoming the means of harm and disturbance to the people. So he plucked up the curry and he went and he moved the tree from there. I mean he cut the tree and removed the roots from there. Now everybody who was passing, it became easier for them to pass. Because of this action, it was so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in return of this action, Allah gave him Jannah. So this tells you how important and how virtuous it is if there is something that becomes the means of harm, if you remove, remove it, what status Islam has given to it?
So here this person is getting a status of getting into Jannah because of removing an obstacle from the path. Now you think about it yourself. That if removing an obstacle is such a great status, then what if what of becoming an obstacle yourself? <coughs> Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said in another hadith that Iman has different stages and different levels. The highest level is to say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And the lowest level, Imatatul Adha Ani Tariq. To remove an obstacle from the path. To remove an obstacle from the path is a sign of Iman. And to become an obstacle in somebody's path, or whichever way, to become, become an obstacle is a deficiency in your Iman. It's a sign that you have weakness in your Iman. Now, this person, because of this good deal of his, by removing something which is harmful to the people, he got the status of getting into Jannah. <coughs> Me and you have to look at our lives, how we have become the means of difficulty and harm to other people. Leave all the examples. I'll give you a simple example which everybody will agree with. Go outside the masjid now and go see how the people have parked the cars. Leave alone all the interactive discussions. Go outside the masjid, not only Jumu'ah time, but every Salah, in every masjid. Then how the Muslims park in other people's driveways. And they do their ibadah nicely afterwards. And they're harming the person who's next door to the masjid. Whether he's a Muslim or not, it's a different topic on its own. But these are the things that Islam has told us not to do. We come to the masjid to do ibadah. I just spoke that if your option ibadah is becoming a means of disturbance to other body, then put a pause on it. Park 200 meters away, walk to the masjid. But don't park your car in such a way that becomes a means of difficulty and harm to other people. This is the simple teachings of Islam. And if you can't benefit people, then the least you can do is don't harm people. So you come to the masjid, see how the Muslims park the cars. It disturbs everybody. The council complains, the people complain, everybody complains. So don't harm anyone. In fact, the Prophet said, when you come to the masjid also, he said, don't eat onions and garlic when you come to the masjid. Of course, it's a different issue because of the malaika, etc. But one of the main reasons why you don't eat onions and garlic when you come to the masjid is because the masjid is a place of interactions. You're going to be talking to the people. You're going to be interacting with people. Now the odor that comes out from your mouth must not become the means of disturbance to the next Muslim. In the same thing we always mention, that if you have a habit of smoking, Allah make it easy for you. But if you have to smoke, then before you come in the masjid, at least wash your hands, wash your mouth and apply some perfume. Because the smell that you have on your body and the odor that you have on your body becomes a means of disturbance to those people who do not smoke. But this is how sensitive our Islam is when it comes to do not harm the people in any way. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam give an example of an onion and garlic also. They do not eat these things, raw onions and raw garlic and come to the masjid because the masjid is a place of interactions. And when you're going to be talking to people, then that's what become the means of harming other people. So the teaching of Islam is simple. Four things. Don't harm yourself. وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّهْلُكَ don't throw yourself in problems. Don't throw yourself in difficulties. Don't throw your heart to yourself in hardships by smoking, by taking drugs, etc. So don't harm your own self. Don't harm other fellow human beings. Don't harm the animals. And don't harm your environment. This is the simple teachings of Islam. So one of the ways of harming ourselves is by taking these cigarettes and drugs, and etc. which becomes a means of harming ourselves. And I will say one important point here is many a times we harm ourselves by expecting a lot of things from other people. And this is something that we have to cut down in our life. As Muslims, we don't hope for any benefit or harm from anyone. Our benefit and harm and our hope should be only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many a time you say, I'll have a relationship with this brother, he's very nice, he works for the immigration, or he's a lawyer, or he's this, or he's that, he got some context, so I'll keep a good relationship with him. So tomorrow when I fall into trouble, he will become the means of delivering me from that problem. And now when you fall into a problem and the man is not there, and you start getting depressed. So I thought he's going to help me, or he's going to give me $5,000, he's borrowing me, or he's going to give me this, or this, or that, whatever it is. So what happening now, because you're building your hopes and having expectations from other people, which you're supposed to not be having in the first place, you end up harming yourself. 
So don't harm yourself and have expectation from other people. Nabi Akareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith also when it comes to harming animals, that don't harm the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is man qatala usfuran fama fawqaha bighayri haqqaha bighayri haqqiha that if someone kills so much as a sparrow or anything larger than that without any just reason then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him about that on the day of Qiyamah. ibn Ayyad rahimahullah used to say that wallahi ma yahilu laka an tu'adhi kalban wala khinziran bighayri haqqin fa kayfa tu'adhi muslimah. Subhanallah. Fudayr ibn Ayyad rahimahullah says it is not right and not justified for you in any way to harm a dog or to harm a pig then how is it possible to harm another human being? It is not right for you to harm another animal without any just reason be it a dog or be it a pig then how is it possible that as a Muslim you harm other people? It doesn't go together it doesn't go together so khair I want to end off on one hadith of Nabi Akareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I will elaborate on the hadith and derive some lessons from the hadith. Nabi Akareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, Man darra adar Allah bihi, wa man shaqa shaqa Allahu alayhi. How come I call the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Whoever harms others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will harm him. And whoever causes hardship to others, Allah will cause hardship for you. What does the hadith mean? Mullah Ali Qali rahimahullah mentions that whoever harms others means that person who becomes the means of disturbance or harming or the first one to stir up trouble. That's what it means. You can ignite fire amongst the people. You create confusion. You create chaos. You create fights. You become the means of taking people's honor. He said, this the hadith means, the one who harm others, meaning the one who is the person to start off trouble. What's going to happen to him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will harm him, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning he will requit him for his action by making the punishment for his crime. <coughs> so whatever he had done, Allah will get the perfect punishment for his crime. <coughs> and the one who brings hardship to other people, Allah will cause hardship to him. What does it mean? Mullah Ali Khali rahimahullah says, Whoever causes hardship means opposing someone and showing hostility towards someone. Allah will cause harm to him, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish him. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish him. So now you understand the hadith. The hadith is saying simple. That the one who harms others, Allah will harm him. Correct? Whoever causes hardship to others, Allah will cause hardship to him. A question is supposed to come to everyone's mind. And that is, if the hadith is saying someone who harms, Allah will harm him. Someone who causes hardship, Allah will cause hardship to him. We see people harming, we see people causing harm to everyone, and we see people causing hardship to everyone, but we don't see the punishment of Allah. Here's the question. If someone might raise this question, okay, Allah is saying, the Prophet is saying this, but we don't see the effects of it. So the first answer to this here is the ulama have mentioned that nothing suggests in the hadith that the punishment will be in this world. Nothing mentions it. Okay, Allah will take the return of the, or the punishment in this world. But rather the ulama have mentioned the second answer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might punish him in this world or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might punish him in the hereafter. Or if the person has repented in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who has harmed him, the person who's being harmed on the day of Qiyamah, Allah will give him so much that he will eventually become happy and then Allah will happy for his death person. And the third answer is a more shivering answer that brings shivers in my body and your body. And the ulama have mentioned that harm sometimes might not fall on that person immediately. Now he is healthy, he is wealthy, he has this arrogance, he has this pride that who do you think you are? It's my company, my car, my this, my that. But he said, give it some time and harm might come to that person at the end of his life. So now you don't see the harm. And at the end of his life, when this person needs everybody around him, his wife will leave him. His children will just obey him. His children will put him in another hospital, another child case, if you don't find him for you. Everybody will leave him, his wealth will leave him, everything will be lost. So 
So that's what, what is the reason that the ulama mentioned? Is sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delays the harm. Sometimes He forgives the person and pardons him in this world and in the hereafter also. But sometimes when you harm people, what is the consequences for it? At the end of your life, and you'll be weak, you'll be sinner, you'll be fragile. That is when the punishment of Allah will come upon you. Where you can't even help yourself, even relieve yourself. So don't harm the people. Don't become the means of harm to other people. Don't become the means of disturbance to other people. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you authority, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you power, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you status, then use all of these powers and authority and your status to bring people together and bring comfort and benefit to the people. Don't use your authority or your power or your status to become the means of harming other people. For causing hardship to other people. The words that we say, the actions that we choose to do, make sure it does not become the means of harm to other people. Many a times the words we say break people's hearts. An example I'll give you. Sometimes you meet a brother, he has no children for the last 10 years. He's married, he may try everything, can't get children. That's a decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for you to come and tell him why you don't have children in public, for you it's a small statement. But what that man is going through in his life because of not having children, by you saying these statements, you break the man's heart. And these statements for the rest of his life, he can never forget it. Because he was going through his own trauma. He was sad, he was going through some problem because you don't have children. And now you publicly say these comments to him, it breaks a person's heart. We think it's small things. But as the person who hears these comments, it's like, like blades going through his heart. If this person insulted me, this person like punished me in this world for something I have no power over. And the ulama have told us, you know, we have this tendency to go to the ulama and say, make dua for me, make dua for me. It's very good. But when you harm people and you oppress people, then those people who you oppress, their duas reach Allah in the the Imam's dua. And now when everybody is making dua for you, everybody's dua is going up. But that one person that you harm, his curse is becoming a barrier for everybody's dua. So nothing is going to come right in your life. Because you took the honor of someone, you took the life of someone, you stole somebody's wealth, you became the means of disturbance and somebody cursed you. All of this become the means that now you make making dua but nothing is coming right in your life. The reason for this here is because that person who you have harmed, that person who you have cursed, his curse has become a barrier for everybody's dua. That's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was very strict with these things. That do not disturb anyone. Don't harm anyone. Don't become the value of somebody's comfort. If somebody is happy news, give him the happy news. Enjoy his happiness. Somebody is sad, be part of his sadness. But don't become the means of disturbance. And